so I, I found myself back in uh, this this back as a civilian lost my identity purpose and and it was at that point life really slowed down as well there wasn't the constant distraction of military operations and and it was at that stage that a whole bunch of stuff that I'd been trying to outrun kind of caught up with me and and it seemed really paradoxical I just I couldn't understand why I could continue to function why we all continued to function and go back to Afghanistan over and over when people were, were getting killed and, and people were getting shot blown up all these exposures but we, we were all okay while we were in that environment and then it seemed not just myself but but lots of people who I knew and and knew about struggled when they got out and and so I started to reflect on this that quote in the book you know what what was the metaphoric armor that right. was protecting us when we were in that environment where you think should be the place where you come <laughs> apart that you lose and you get out and then everything on paper is better but you struggle and hello beautiful people on today's podcast we have dr dan prong dan has served on over 100 combat missions in afghanistan as a frontline special forces combat doctor he was awarded a commendation for distinguished service for his conduct in combat and upon discharge after five years of service, Dan completed an MBA and moved into medical and leadership roles. He's known as Dr. Dan on SAS Australia and is the author of two books, The Resilient Shield and his newest publish, The Combat Doctor. What I love about this conversation is Dan's openness, vulnerability and self-awareness. You can go in conversation anywhere with Dan, which really provided the freedom to go deep into self-worth, identity, purpose, combat, the loss of fellow soldiers, PTSD, the effects on home life, and how him being the sum total of all his experiences brought him to not only understanding psychologically, but also scientifically the art and importance of resilience and post-traumatic growth. Let's just say it's a good one. Please enjoy this conversation with Dan. Welcome to To Be Human, Dan. Yeah, thanks, Jenna Louise. It's magic to be here. So, Dan, you uh, just released a beautiful new book called The Combat Doctor. And at the start of this book, you have Theodore Roosevelt's Man in the Arena speech or quote. Why is this important to you? That's one. So that's one of a handful that my dad presented to us. So my brother and I when we were very young kids. And, and it was something, It, it and uh, If by Rudyard Kipling and Desiderata by Max Ehrman were all themes of our childhood. And, and they're all these, there's so, so much good stuff in there. You can pick apart every single line of every one of those things, I think, and, and really drill down into the meaning of that. They're like mantras. And as I've gone through life, they've, they've evolved to mean different things to me as I've had mm. different experiences. But I just, that that man in the arena and just that initial line of it's not the critic who counts is just so powerful, you know. It's been a real a real focal point of mine, a real mantra, a real motivator over the years. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I certainly feel like it's one of the most profound ones I've experienced. I was introduced to it by Brene Brown. Uh, but I certainly l- use it in my everyday life. I think it's a very powerful influence how did that sort of help you? Like, you know, we're on the theme of you being a combat doctor. How did you sort of use that as something of support during those experiences? Well, I guess backing up and, and looking at the the pipeline that led to that that privileged position of being mm. a doctor with Army Special Operations, there was the, the medical schooling, there was the, the military entry requirements and training, and then uh, the special forces selection process. There was these hurdles. And and I, as I sort of strove towards a lot of these, there, there were critics in my life that were sort of saying, no, nah, I don't, don't reckon you can do that, or that seems like a pipe dream. And, and so it was good to just keep me on an even keel and keep me focused when mm. I was beginning to self-doubt because, you know, 175 centimeters, 70 kilo bloke. I'm not. I'm not a big guy, you know. And these these aspirations of passing SAS selection did seem a bit far fetched to some. But but also as you go through that that man in the arena passage and you come towards the end and it talks about you know who who at best knows the triumph of great victory or if he fails at least fails whilst daring greatly so that right. his place will never be with those cold and timid souls 
who knew neither victory nor defeat. It's it's basically it talks to me to say, live your best life, you know, let go of what others think of you, live authentically, be vulnerable, put yourself out there and don't die wondering. And, and that's always been a, a philosophy of mine throughout my adult life is to, to have a go because you only get one go at these things. And, and, you know, if it all ends poorly, at least you won't die wondering, you'll, you'll know. And you, you brought up selection and, you know, some people thinking that it was a bit of a far-fetched ideal for you to be seeking. What was the mindset that kind of got you through that? Because, I mean, in itself, just having people that aren't supporting you in your dreams is quite a big difficulty just in itself. But then you have selection on top of that, which is obviously hugely enduring physically and mentally. What is sort of the mindset that just kept you going through such difficulty? When I reflect, the the mindset one was one of, of absolute confidence in my own ability to be able to get to the finish of the course. And, and mm-hmm. I, I hope that doesn't come across as as arrogance. It was just I had I had focused on this for years. As it turned out, I you know had six years to to train towards this, think about this from when I worked out I wanted to be part of the SAS until I could first get on that course was a six year period. So so I'd had this chance to almost evolve myself mentally into that person I needed to be. And so in my mind, the the, the getting on selection. Uh, you know, finishing that course, uh, unless I got injured or or they took me off the course, I was never going to quit. It was almost like a foregone wow. conclusion that I was going to be there at the end. Whether I got selected or not, that was out of my hands. All I could do was my best on that course. And and so it, it was, the, the mindset was just get on. I knew I wasn't going to be the best uh, soldier on that course. You know, I'd come in as a doctor, as a, as a pretty sort of physically small guy, but I, I knew that I was mentally tough and prepared and I really wanted this. And, and so that mindset was I'm, I'm going to do my absolute best to finish this thing. Uh, I may get injured and that's how it is. I may get removed from the course for whatever reason, but I ain't going to sign myself off this course. And if I'm still standing at the end, it's over to the unit to decide whether I'm suitable or not. Yeah, I always get really curious about this mindset of like not quitting. Um I used to do some military inspired events, like 24 hour events, obviously yep. very different to well, to selection. Um, but it, you know, it gave me a taster of that experience. And I remember one particular time I did a 24 hour one, uh, there was still people dropping out at 22 hours. And I just, at that point in time, I just I had so much disbelief. I just didn't get it. It's like, you got two hours to go, like just you can do it, like just get through it. And it was, it was almost this, as you're speaking to this, like in a sense of strength and knowing like the conviction element, I suppose, that I just knew there was nothing that was going to stop me. Where do you think that's derived from? Oh, look, I think it comes from, I think it's strongly linked to a growth mindset. So this ability to face challenges and see them as an opportunity to test yourself and, and grow, you know, as opposed to a fixed mindset that's very binary, either I'm passing or I'm failing I I think it when I track my uh, sort of experience back to to school age I I think it's probably seeded in never really excelling at anything throughout my childhood and so (laughs) it's kind of one of these kids that I did okay don't get me wrong I'm not one of these sort of inspirational cases of came from from poverty or or adversity I normal middle age existence but but never excelled never was the the best at anything and and so I think that that gives you this balanced approach as you go through life but also just this resignation that that if you want something, you're going to have to work for it. It's not going to come that right. It's not going to be easy. But at, at some point along that path, I started to realise that there was a definite link between the cause and effect, effort and, and output, you know. And, and so yeah. that, that it's a pretty simple formula, but it's not shiny. It's not sexy. It, it, it requires the the month in month out just grinding away at whatever it is to to reach a point and and at some stage in my high schooling I, I'd started to run middle distance and could see that clear link the more I trained the better my results and it just started to fuel this thing and then I found that that same link academically not until university I, I wasn't very studious at school but but it all kind of started to occur to me in early adulthood that that hey there's probably a whole bunch more things possible in life 
if if I'm just prepared to put in the effort. And so I set set this lofty goal of of well medicine and then uh, medicine with army special operations and and lo and behold it it, it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> It certainly did. And obviously that had you um, sort of traveling to places like East Timor and Afghanistan. I sort of, I I want to talk to you about, I know that you kind of speak to, particularly in the beginning stages of of doing this traveling, this sense of, you call it a naive illusion of invulnerability. Why do you think that is? I think with any of these, it, it just seems so unreal. The the idea mm. of being in combat, the idea of of gunfighting, the idea of of teammates or even myself being killed. It, I, I think, until you experience it firsthand, certainly until I experienced it firsthand, it just didn't seem quite real. And yeah, and I'd been to Timor, and there wasn't much going on at Timor by the time I got there it was 2008 and it was a very safe environment and so you know I'd done this deployment my first deployment with the the regular army and and come home from that it was a great experience uh, but there was it certainly wasn't a, a warlike experience and and then went into special operations did my first tour of Afghanistan and we we had a fair share of gunfights and we had a couple of blokes shot but not badly injured lots of near misses and so that just reinforced this uh, illusion that hey we're we're above this that people getting killed at war isn't us we're we're special right. forces and we're invulnerable and yeah yeah and and it, it was an illusion it got shattered on my second tour but I think just being in those environments and actually experiencing things like combat and and that sort of thing and and then coming out of you know five six months of that with no one being seriously injured or killed Mm. gave me this false sense of security and how does that change for you because obviously as you're suggesting there is a point until like that you realize that you are actually in an incredibly vulnerable position when you're in something like war and combat Mm. Did your why change for you when you were out there? Yeah, it did. That that happened. That happened slowly. But the mm. catalyst, with hindsight, for that happening was my second tour of Afghanistan, where, which is kind of the the pivotal point in the book, and it's it's uh, what the book is centered around, really. The the and it was the loss of three teammates in pretty quick succession mm. in combat in Afghanistan in two thousand and eleven. Uh, so three separate missions and had took casualties. I'd responded to all of them and and there was three that I couldn't save. And and that was where that that illusion was shattered. It was like, no, hang on a sec, we we are playing for keeps. This is real. And in my medical role, it was it was on me to try and save these patients that now all of a sudden in my previous medical experience in civilian hospitals and that sort of a thing, the person you're trying to save is almost exclusively a stranger and you're almost right. exclusively working as part of a broader resuscitation team that, that I was never, as a junior doctor, I was never the lead of. And then all of a sudden this thing changed. I, I was I was it. I was the boss. I was the, the medical lead on the ground. These were blokes who I knew. And mm. and so that that just changed everything. And so not being able to save those blokes really uh, just recalibrated my view on on this uh, this experience that that was war. The the vulnerability of us. I mean, these soldiers, from a soldiering perspective, could run rings around me. And I'm sort of yeah. I realized, hey, hang on, if if these guys can get killed, then then none of us are safe, you know. So yeah. And in the background, as all that was happening. Uh, I had I, I was married. I had a, a young son, a, a second son on the way. Uh, these sort of things, and and so it was. There was a whole bunch of factors playing into this uh, real morphing of my view of my role as a doctor with with Army Special Operations. And what was that juxtaposition like for you? Obviously, you're there as a doctor, as you're suggesting, not primarily as a soldier. Hmm. What is it like being surrounded by? I mean, the reason why, part of the reason why you're there is to protect yourselves whilst also sort of delivering the mission. What is it like being surrounded by somewhat death to one extent, but also being the guy on the ground that's responsible for saving lives? 
It was a really, really privileged position. I use the term mm-hmm. privileged a lot about my previous experiences and my current experiences because that's that's the way I feel. But the to be to have that that higher medical skill set and and to be accepted into a, an organisation like Army Special Operations allowed to go out on missions was a, was a real uh, it really was a privileged position. But and I I didn't think too much about it at the time that that paradox of of being in an environment where we're sent on missions that that would almost always end up in gunfights and use of lethal force but my primary role was to try and save lives and mm. and that spanned a, a spectrum of, of of people from our guys so the you know the soldiers next to me to civilians who unfortunately would get caught up in the in the the gunfight to enemy fighters if they were incapacitated but not killed then it was the my responsibility to to save them as well and so it was this odd when i reflect on it use of force up to and including lethal force should be at one end of a spectrum providing care to save someone's life should be at the complete other right. it, it should they, they should be diametrically opposed and somehow they were kind of bent around to link up so that you'd, you'd be out you know potentially using lethal force one minute and quite literally the next minute maybe trying to save the life of someone who was just trying to kill you. So it was this yeah. really kind of, yeah. uh, from a psychological perspective, a really <laughs> odd transition from that use of, of force to provision of care. But it, it came naturally at the time. I think that was a byproduct of the, the training that we got. Right. And I want to sort of start going into the area of mental health with you. And first of all, in relation to what we're talking about, you shared this kind of beautiful paragraph in your book, on sort of this idea that you felt like there was an existence of a set of divine scales and sort of for your own headspace, you wanted to ensure that you felt like you saved more than you had lost and that that would in itself put your demons to rest. Can you share more about that thinking for you? Yeah, so I think that was probably a little uh, naive as well to think that somehow you could balance this out. But that mm. that started to happen after that second tour when we'd started to lose members of our task group. And, and that, as I said, that was a real turning point, a real fulcrum for me. And, and I started to, with hindsight, I started to accumulate this, this unprocessed trauma really is what it was. Yeah. I, I didn't realise that's what it was at the time or for years later. Uh, and because it, I was still able to function and, and not just me, the whole task group, you know, we were all still able to keep functioning despite the fact that time and time again, we were having blokes hit, blokes killed. And, but I started to see these, these losses as, as like negatives on a set of these celestial, celestial scales and, and they were weighing down one side. And I, they, on some level, they were bothering me. I, I certainly was revisiting those uh, situations regularly and starting to have a, you know, bad dreams and flashbacks and things at that stage and I at that time I thought the solution to this was just to try and save as many lives as I can right. if I could save more than I lost then things would balance and, and and I'd be okay somehow that would negate these negative experiences and and it, it sounds silly to me to say it out loud now but but when I was in that bubble, that's what I thought yeah. the solution was. It wasn't to back off. Not that I could. I still had my job to do. But it wasn't to back off and revisit and process. It was to charge forward and try and right. try and do more good, try and get better, be the best I can, see more trauma, save more people. And that would make me better. But, but you know, saying it out loud now sounds, sounds silly to me anyway. But um, at the time, that was how I saw it. Yeah, I think you use like an interesting word, like the bubble uh, that that was sort of my uh, interpretation of it is like, you know, as humans, we behaviorally adapt yes. to our circumstances yes. and what you had to do in that moment served you. And then and obviously <clears throat> in separating yourself from that experience and particularly in returning home, to my understanding, I think you did four tours uh, to yeah. Afghanistan. What is it like, because there was sort of an interesting contrast that you shared in your book that I really enjoyed where you were like, every time that you came home, nothing had changed, so to speak, Mm. but your perspective and your view had changed. Can you talk about that change in your life? Yeah, it it was a real eye opener. It's 
I think we live, and, and you're exactly right. I mean, we, 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 as humans, we adapt to our environment. And, mm. and I think the psychologists call that hedonic adaptation. If you spend enough time in one environment, that becomes your new normal. And, and I talk a lot to first responders about this, that, that uh, be it a paramedic, be it a police officer, fire officer, soldier, emergency department staff, mental health worker, whatever it is. Once you're in that environment for a while, it seems normal to you and it's further normalised. And, and that term, the bubble, I think is a good one. If you're in that environment and you're the person to the left of you and the person to the right of you is having the same experiences, same exposures, that further normalises it. And, and right. things like I, I did a session with some police officers just late last week and and just talking about some of these hugely abnormal experiences, all this exposure to, to dead bodies, car crashes, you know, human suffering, either directly or indirectly, the vicarious trauma that comes with that, the moral injury, and sometimes not being able to act. I mean, there's all this stuff that seems normal to them, but but it is very abnormal. And and but when you're in the bubble, you, you don't know that. You can't see it because you lose this reference point to what normal is. And, yeah. and so I think what was happening is I'd I'd go over, have these experiences with the task group and, and then come back and, and, and get recalibrated to this combat environment, to, to losing mates in combat. To, and, and it wasn't all bad. You know, I mean, there was a lot of high highs, these, these really yeah. successful military missions. I, I found the operational environment and particularly the combat environment to be hugely stimulating and professionally rewarding. The times when I responded to casualties and everything went well and you had a good result. There was nothing better, you know. I'd be I'd be high as a kite on on adrenaline after that, and and it, it was addictive for me. I I loved it, but then you come back to home, which is my wife and the young kids, and it's it's it was really hard to to adjust back to that life, if if not impossible at the time, and you start to see all the stuff that broader society thinks is important, and it is important. I don't mean to diminish it, but the things that were stressing my wife seemed so inconsequential right. when you have kneeled over your mate and not been able to save them yeah. in, in a gunfight in Afghanistan. And so, so it was a really hard uh, to try and, and appreciate and not diminish the significance of other people's stress and concerns back in, in, uh, in, in normal society because that recalibration had started to occur. And is that what you did, Dan? Is that what helped you in kind of coming back into quote unquote like normal society was having that sort of appreciation for the normal circumstances of life again? Not initially. So while I was in, it was very much just, you know, try and pretend to be a normal human while I'm home yeah. and just count days until I could get back to Afghanistan to, yeah. to be honest. And, and so, you know, the, the third and fourth trips I, I'd, I'd changed my perspective on the role had changed and I'd realized that this particularly during my my fourth trip I would sort of made that realization that this job's probably doing me a lot of harm and and something you know the stress is accumulating but I still loved it and so it was this this real vexing sort of thing and it was what I did it was all I'd done for the last five years it was my identity. I identified as a, a doctor with Army Special Operations. I didn't know who I was outside of that uniform. And so the knowledge that I could keep going back and doing this job that I loved but started to register was 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 probably slowly killing me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that that was what kept me going through the times at, at home. And and then, you know, and I think a lot of veterans and maybe police officers, first responders will relate to this. You learn to just adjust your, well, your behaviour and your interactions, but also your exposures in society to, with hindsight, to accommodate for the fact that you are wound up, that you're hypervigilant, you're right. hyper-stressed, you're probably starting down the pathway of post-traumatic stress, but um, you, you just stop going to crowded places because you know they make you anxious, you, you know, th these sort of things. And but it doesn't register at the time that, that the answer isn't stop going to those places. It's to stop and work out why you don't right. want to go to those places. But, yeah. but at the time, it was just too easy to, to sort of fake it while I was at home and just wait to get back overseas. Yeah, I feel like this is such a common experience. And I mean, not even for people that have sort of been in former combat mm. conditions, but if you experience difficult times in your life that are traumatic. Yep. And I mean, in your book, you do speak to this almost, you know, you were living quite an anxious 
an angry life towards the end and you were sort of starting to numb that with alcohol, which is a very common occurrence in our society. And you spoke about uh, Jordan Peterson, sort of like the idea of this inner monster that we all have. And you sort of talk about Carl Jung's shadow as well. What was your experience life in, like in relation to sort of becoming this inner monster, but then being able to sort of tame this inner monster? I, it was something that, and when I read the Peterson's work around that, it, it really resonated. And that wasn't until well after the fact, you know, maybe 2015, 16 or something that I, I read his work and and then started to look back at, at the, the shadow Carl Jung, which I was familiar with actually, through a tool song of all things, they, they wow. <laughs> to the, the shadow shedding skin and, and what have you. And I knew that reference point. And, but as to how it related to me, I, I didn't really think of that. And, but when I read Peterson's work and, and him elaborating on Jung's shadow and talking about, you know, it's not about suppressing this, this inner, what he calls monster, but just sort of this darker side of yourself that we all have, but is, has no real purposeful role in in broader society it's you know Peterson's view r- r- really resonated with me that it's not about it's not about suppressing and never giving the monster any sort of airtime it's about in, embodying that monster when the opportunity presents but then yes. learning to tame it so that you don't just mm-hmm. fly into this these fits of rage it's ha- have that that facet to your personality which exists embrace it and acknowledge it and have it for if you need it, if and when, but but right. don't allow it to kind of take hold without conscious control. And and so for me, that was the first time I think, and and I, I, I talked to this in the book, I think a lot of veterans or people who have experienced trauma look at that and think that a part of them has died. Or they, I know a lot of veterans that have a lot of guilt about not feeling guilty about things and it sort of challenges wow. your humanity. You, you look back and, and I have this myself, I look back on certain experiences and I think a normal person should feel bad about that, but I just don't, you know, with certain things, other things I do and and that, that can be quite challenging. But I think this idea that rather than something being broken or something having died, it's it's just that you have you've you've lived as this monster or you've hopped into this shadow and then mm. you've experienced this darker side of your personality and I, I i know a lot of people that that love being that it's a very empowering and in the right context you know that's that ability to like on operations in afghanistan to to go out and to do your mission to use force to get in gunfights and it's it's all appropriate and sanctioned and part of the job and and that's 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 this monster and, and you can grow to love that but I think you need to understand that that has no role in broader society when you when you come back you right. need to kind of pack pack the monster away know, know that he's there <laughs> and, you know, if, if for whatever reason you're called on if a, you turn up to a car crash you, you you have that you you're empowered to know that you can probably act pretty well under a high stress environment and control the scene maybe get someone out of a car whatever the case may be or if you need to resolve a situation. And that's when you know that monster's there, but you've got it tame. It's not going to come out inappropriately. And that, that re- yeah, so Peterson's work really spoke to me uh, in that regard. It was a, a kind of an aha moment. Yeah, it reminds me, and I know he uses this quote. It's not his quote, but um, he, he talks about how it's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. Yeah. And I really love that quote. Because I think it really speaks to what you're speaking about. It's 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 the ability to have the capacity to use that sort of you know quote unquote in a monster if we need to, but to not let it sort of be in the driver's seat, so to speak. Yeah, agreed. And and I, I think another one that Peterson uses, and I'm probably going to butcher it, but but he talks about you know are you worried about what strong men can do? Wait till you see what weak men can do, kind of thing. And wow. and, and I think that's another interesting one this this it's not about strong versus weak it's about that that ability to have strength like be the warrior in the garden and and have that that tool set if you need it for whatever reason then then not have it and need it and in your book you talk about well you ask this question what metaphoric armor has been stripped from me when I took my literal armor off for the last time I'd really love to learn more about your path of discovery sort of post being a combat doctor and certainly how that sort of relates to post-traumatic growth for you. 
Mm. Well, that that whole process, so that I discharged from the army in 2014, I'd come back from my fourth tour of Afghanistan, my wife was heavily pregnant with our third son. And, and, uh, it, you know, to this day, I'm grateful that, that I at least had the, the common sense to listen to my wife when she said, hey, that's, that's enough. And, and she yeah. was right. And, and so discharged a few months after that, got out. And, and I had not foreseen the, the struggle that that transition was going to be. Like I was, I was physically uninjured. I was leaving the military on my own accord. And I had this, you know, this qualification that translated into civilian life as a doctor not only did it translate and got me a job but it doubled my wage when I got got out you know so it was everything looked rosy and then in the those years after discharge a couple of years I really struggled and and when I look back on that that was things like the loss of identity the loss of purpose right. but also moving away from my tribe that that group of people that I'd had these incredibly rich experiences with both good and bad who I knew understood me uh, was was very important whether or not we'd sit around and talk about stuff it didn't really matter I knew that they knew and that was supportive right. and so yeah. they lost this tribe I'd gone from military back to being a civilian and I had ignorantly during my time with the military started to look down my nose at civilians as if yeah. somehow military are you know better than them which is, is ridiculous of course and because I was a civilian beforehand and I <laughs> it's just dumb but yeah. but it talks to social identity theory in these groups and you form in groups and and then you strengthen your in-group identity by uh, sometimes diminishing the out-group and say military and civilian, you know, there's this divide. And anyway, so I, I found myself back in uh, this, this back as a civilian, lost my identity purpose. And, and it was at that point, life really slowed down as well. There wasn't the constant distraction of military operations. And, and it was at that stage that a whole bunch of stuff that I'd been trying to outrun kind of caught up with me. And, and it seemed really paradoxical. I just, I couldn't understand why I could continue to function, why we all continued to function and go back to Afghanistan over and over when people were, were getting killed and, and people were getting shot, blown up, all these exposures. But we, we were all OK while we were in that environment. Mm. And then it seemed not just myself, but but lots of people who I knew and and knew about struggled when they got out. And, and so wow. I started to reflect on this, that quote in the book, you know, what, what was the metaphoric armour that right. was protecting us when we were in that environment where you think should be the place where you're going to come <laughs> apart that you lose and you get out and then everything on paper is better but you struggle and and so that was that started this deep dive into resilience uh, into I could see that I was clearly starting to get the signs of post-traumatic stress uh, as a doctor that was obvious to me I, I wasn't ready for that diagnosis I never got that diagnosis which was my fault I didn't seek the professional help that that might have uh, really helped but for me I just wanted to delve into what was happening with me look at what the psychological literature said about about transition about uh, post-traumatic stress about resilience about stress in general to try and codify it from a scientific perspective and then try and work out some tools to be able to rebuild resilience. I, I knew that I'd done it in the military. I could see that I was now, you know, starting again as a civilian, if you like. How do I rebuild an identity? How do I rebuild purpose? How do I rebuild tribe? And how do I, from a Maslow's hierarchy perspective, how do I self-actualize again? Because that all got stripped away. Those top layers of Maslow's hierarchy got stripped away when I left the military because they were all contingent on that and so how do I rebuild all that and that led to the the resilient shield project so the the book that that my brother and Tim Curtis another ex SAS uh, both of them and myself wrote last year and so that that was the this sort of path to trying to rebuild resilience when I got out of the army that when we dug deeper into it we realized hang on the fundamentals of how stress affects humans physically and psychologically, and the fundamentals of how you build resilience are universal. You, you, this isn't just about soldiers. This, this is more right. widely applicable. And, and so that that led to the development of that resilience shield model and the book and, and everything we've done with that. So, yeah, that was the, the catalyst, just this reflection, hang on, I, I was hanging in there when all the <laughs> horrible stuff was happening and now I'm struggling <laughs> and nothing horrible is happening. What, why is this? Yeah. Yeah, I'm really interested because... I'm interested in like sort of the the practical uh, standpoint of resilience for you because obviously post traumatic stress, to my understanding, is 
sort of experienced differently between people and, and the way in which they treat it, particularly there's lots of different options out there. What do you feel practically has helped you the most in being able to sort of mo- move through that sort of post-traumatic stress that you have experienced? I think the, the the revisiting those events and doing a balanced after action review, if you like, like mm. having a look, trying to remove emotion from the events and the, and the, the events that I'm talking of are the, the key ones where I, I responded to mates couldn't couldn't save them and 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 there was a, f- a few other scatterings of fairly sort of horrific exposures over the years and and as humans we suffer from negativity bias we we fixate on the negative we value it more than we do neutral or positive and so when you remember an event if there's a negative aspect to it you're going to latch onto that this was the day i couldn't save you know my mate was was how i viewed a lot of these things but but when i took a step back and and did a more balanced after action review of like one instance we we were on a, a job 48 hours near constant combat for that whole time and and we had seven casualties so seven blokes got hit in that in that 48 hour period and and we did we did lose one and i mean nothing will ever diminish the fact that that we lost a soldier that day but but the other six we were able to stabilize and evacuate and they they did okay and so when you start to look at it in a bit more of a balanced fashion the Another big epiphany for me that came some years down the track was was the realization that that these blokes that that I had a go at trying to save and couldn't they wouldn't want me burning years of my life dwelling and ruminating and and not living my best life on account of the fact that they're no longer with us. I'm I'm, I'm sure of that. They'd be the sort of blokes who would be thinking, "Hey, you know, you gave it your best, didn't turn right. out." And I started to realize that it was on me to live my best life to honor these guys, not to sort of have this period of my life that was was not living my best life because of these guys. They wouldn't want that. And I was, in effect, I was kind of doing it to myself was the way I viewed it. I was I was holding on to those memories in the wrong way. I was using right. this negative anchor kind of pulling me back rather than thinking, hey, hang on. No, I need to get my act together and, and actually live my best life and, and try and yeah. take these experiences, process them, pull what I can out of them that that I can grow from, get myself back to a good point, and then started looking at, well, who can I deliver these lessons to? I've learned, I've learned these lessons from these experiences that are really unusual. Who else needs this information, hopefully ahead of an event like that, to be better prepared for the event? And, and so... Mm-hmm. You know, the, the initial audience was combat medics or uh, doctors going into the military, trying to deliver these lessons learned to them ahead of the time. And, and then as the, the lens widened a bit to what are the resilience lessons here and the Resilient Shield Project, it's like, well, you know, we've had these experiences. Yeah, they sucked. Uh, get yourself back to a good place. Take, distill it down into the, these core resilience lessons and then find the audience who might benefit from this and and try and get this information out to them. And so that's this whole post-traumatic growth piece. It's this recalibration of, of, or just processing of the trauma to get back to a good point and then doing something positive with it, but also to, to better appreciate my life, you know, to, to realize that, Hey, I, for whatever reason, I wasn't the one that got shot or blown up or killed in a helicopter crash. And so here I am with, with my wife and my kids, I've got to be the best husband and the best dad that I can be. I've got to turn up the best version of myself because these other blokes, you know, don't have the same opportunity. So yeah, that, that whole post-traumatic growth thing, it's, it's about what you're able to do with those experiences to, to process them and hopefully find some positives in them. And do you feel like, or has that changed or impacted uh, your dreams and nightmares that you were experiencing. Yeah, look, I mean that's all faded. Uh, thankfully, you know, I'm very wow. lucky that that that's no longer a thing for me at all. And and so and and this has happened over a process of years. It's not something right. that sort of suddenly went away. But the certainly revisiting and and addressing and working through and and there's there's been input over the years from psychologists 
uh, you know, this isn't all just me, but the finding mindfulness and meditation was an absolute game changer for me, absolute game changer. And and this is something every opportunity I get, I, I sort of scream from my, my little soapbox to first responders that you need to be doing this. This this optimizes you as a first responder. It makes you better in high stress environments, but yeah. it also helps you get this more balanced, non-judgmental, you know, lower chronic stress load and, and better appreciation of, of your experiences and, and being able to make meaningful sense of them. But, but yes, yeah, so I think this, this whole, uh, that the whole process that's gone on over the last, what is now, you know, eight years since I discharged has, has slowly got me to reintegrate back as a civilian, rebuild my self-worth in a new domain, but more based on, on me as an individual rather than me as a doctor in a role or me as right. someone, you know, so it's less contingent on, on my work or other life domains. It's, it's centred around me, uh, which is where you need your identity and your self-esteem to come from. Yeah. But, but do, doing all this and, and building self-worth again and sort of self-actualizing, processing the things that had happened to get back to baseline, distilling the good things and then trying to use them uh, to, to grow myself and deliver to others has, has all just had this effect of getting me back to a much better place. And with all of that, the, the, the flashbacks and bad dreams and anything that you might have considered post-traumatic stress has now gone thankfully and it's been gone for some time mm. yeah it reminds me of um ben crow who's a mindset coach to ash Barty. Uh, yeah, yeah. he speaks yeah you know him i do i do yeah so he speaks sort of about what you're speaking to uh, of separating the person from the persona yeah. or he sort of speaks about it in relation to like be a good human first and then like a good athlete second or you know insert whatever yep. profession it is that you do and i think that is so incredibly helpful for people when they're experiencing change and they've put so much sense of identity on one particular profession that when they change um, it doesn't feel like a loss of self but it's just sort of a change in circumstance so it's amazing to hear that that's also sort of working for you in the, in the teachings around what you do. Oh, for sure. And I'm, I'm lucky enough to have engagement with a couple of professional sporting organisations and, and ongoing input into uh, elite elements of military and, and police. And, and this is something that I, I talk to them often about and, and just I, I kind of frame it around the, 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 the prestige belongs to the uniform, not to you. And so if, if your identity fused, if your identity is as a professional sports person or a tactical police officer or an army special operator, then that's great while that's going well, but you need to know <laughs> who you are when you take that uniform off, otherwise yeah. you're headed for a fall. And, and so, yeah, that's, that's a crucial thing. And, and I, think, I think of it as Venn diagrams, you know, your identity and your role, and if they overlap, and you have a it, someone attacks you your role, so your performance in your job, and you identify as that role, then that's a personal attack. Right. Whereas if you've got a bit of an air gap between the two, you can see no, that person's just having a go at how I kicked the ball on this particular game of footy. That's right. not a personal attack. <laughs> that's yeah. just, just some punter, you know, passionate about his footy, he's having a go at me because I've missed a goal or whatever. And and you can start to tease that apart. But if your identity is fused with your role, that's a personal attack and it affects your ego and and yeah it's it's but it's you, you need to the problem is with these elite organizations you need to be hugely invested in your role so it's it's sort of this you back off too far and you're not invested enough yeah <laughs> fall off that that elite level but but you need to just have some awareness of, of who you are which is tough in military and professional sport because often people will have gone into those pursuits in late adolescence early adulthood and so they form their first adult identity within those environments and so when they pop out the other end they don't know who they are as an adult their only adult identity they have is either soldier or football player cricketer or tactical cop right and then it, it, you got to rebuild that from scratch which is tough mm. and in your epilogue you share it is a cautionary tale for those contemplating a similar path. The psychological injuries you suffer might be as severe as the physical wounds you treat, and the battle to reintegrate into society may prove as fierce as any gunfight you encounter in the field. And you share that on a podcast you were sort of asked basically the question, would you do it all over again knowing what you know now? And you said that you would, which... To an extent, didn't surprise me and to an extent did. There was a paragraph and I, I 
didn't know where it was. I was going to go back to it and share it, but there was a paragraph in your book that made me think otherwise, that made me think yeah. maybe you wouldn't have answered that. Yeah. So for you, what is it that sort of puts you over the line saying that everything that you know now, you would do it all over again? I guess we're, we're the net sum of all our experiences throughout our life. And, and where I'm at at the moment is, is a great spot. I'm, you know, I'm enthused about life. I'm doing things that I love. I've got this amazing wife and these incredible young boys. They're, they're 14, 11 and 9. And so I'm in a position now where I've, I can kind of do, do part-time work, pay the bills, hang out with my kids and my wife and, and you know, and the work I'm doing, I love. And, and so I guess if you map that back, the, the only reason I'm at this point now is, is the net sum of all those experiences along the way. And the only reason that, that people can experience post-traumatic, to, to experience post-traumatic growth, you have to have the trauma. You can't get to that <laughs> same point. And this is the thing that if you can view trauma as a gift and realize, hang on, if I do the right thing with this and process it and grow from it, you can use it as a launch pad to be a better version of yourself. And, and that's yeah. me today. If I hadn't have had all these, these horrific experiences in uniform, I couldn't be the version of myself that I am today. And, and I, I think when you're referring to that passage in the book, I suspect that's the, when I got home from my second tour of Afghanistan and, and I was wound up, I was fried, I was trying to make sense of these things that had happened in quick succession. And, and, and I just broke down and cried uh, when I saw my wife. I, I just, you know, bawled inconsolably. And it was it is actually the last, I think it's probably the last time I've cried. I'd probably need to get, get a bit better at, at that as a bloke. But, but um, and at that stage, I swore black and blue, I'm never going back to that place. And and I do, I very deliberately use that in the book to indicate my frame of mind at that very moment. I'm like, that was horrible. This is terrible. I never should have done this. This sucks, uh, you know. And that was that crushing realisation, hey, hang on, we, we are vulnerable and people are going to probably continue to get killed, maybe me, you know. And so, so that was my mindset then and, and then kind of processed it and approached it from a different direction. But to fast forward to, you know, the epilogue of the book, yeah, wouldn't change a thing. It's it's all led to where I'm at now and where I'm at right now is fantastic. So, yep. Beautiful. Well, thanks for this amazing conversation, ah, Dan. Yeah. I really appreciate it. I think uh, – I very much thank you for your vulnerability and openness. I sort of shared this before we press record. Just in reading your book, um, there's something always amazing about going on a journey with someone and knowing that they're very self-aware and they're open to sharing that self-awareness and everything that's been learnt and reflected. So thank you for that. Oh, thanks for those comments. And, and it really pleases me to hear that that's what you took from it. I desperately didn't mm. want this to be a book of war stories uh, I wanted this to to tell the the human story of of what happens in those places. So I'm I'm glad that that came through. Thank you. So on a final note, Dan, I would love to ask you, what does it mean to you to be human? That's a brilliant question. And I know before we started recording, you, you'd sent this ahead of time, so I've had time to <laughs> ponder it and 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 mull it over. And and you know, <laughs> I could talk for thirty minutes on this, but I, for me, it distills down to to a great Stoic philosophy: memento mori, remember that you will die. I think is is at the essence, and it, it sounds pretty morbid and and sort of morose, but but ultimately that keeping that perspective that that hey you're going to die at some point like this this human experience is finite mm -hmm. and you know you never know when when fate's going to intervene everything's impermanent be it be it material items relationships your health and and you as an individual we're, we're all on a, a ticking timeline and so it's for me it's about recognizing that appreciating trying to really uh, milk everything out every day your interactions maximize my time with my kids try to do the best i can with this body i've got to keep it fit and healthy but but also keep pursuing these ambitious goals and and not be the cold and timid soul who knew neither victory nor defeat that we you know we started this discussion with because something you know somewhere in the not too distant future I'm going to be a seven, well, hopefully, I'm going to be a 75 year old bloke. My back's going to be shot. My knees are going to be buggered. And I don't want to look back and think, geez, I wonder if I could have, you know? So yeah. it's, it's about don't die wondering. It's about just making the most out of each day. It's about connecting with other humans, hopefully inspiring them. If you've reached a pinnacle 
of whatever level in whatever domain it is that you you've worked towards don't use that as a kind of high point to step on someone's head to stop them getting right. up you know reach down and pull them up with you like try, <laughs> but if you can inspire others do it because we're all we're all having this human experience but yeah i think it comes back to that remember one day you're going to die try and let go of the opinion of others it's not the critics who count live your best life and put yourself out there be authentic vulnerable enthusiastic live your best life let other people around you know that you love them if you love them tell them that don't uh, don't let that sort of don't let a day go by or a, a night go by where you don't say that to your kids or your significant other and get out there and have your best crack at this uh, this one life that we get <laughs>